Welcome everybody to the Dronecast podcast, a podcast by UAV Hub. So today is a special episode, a bonus episode, uh, if you will, and uh, essentially we're going to talk about uh, the new Parrot Anafi AI. So uh, not uh, a proper episode, I suppose. This is just a quick sort of update or an off-the-cuff episode, I suppose, really. And we're just going to have a bit of a talk about this new aircraft. It was uh, released uh, yesterday, which was the uh, the 30th of June, and uh, we've got, uh, as always, uh, Adam and Matthew in the studio today and we're going to just talk through the specs and uh, just kind of unpack exactly what was released I suppose so uh, hopefully again you'll find all of this uh, information useful and uh, yeah so uh, the first thing to talk about I guess is uh, is the name so it's a uh, Parrot Anafi AI so quite an interesting one they've stuck with the Anafi name and they've obviously gone with AI so not really 100% sure why they've gone the AI route potentially with with that name but I guess we'll have a uh, a bit of a chat about that side of things and uh, I guess uh, yeah anyone to start with got any idea about why they've gone with that name what do we think is it is it to do with kind of sort of uh, the feature set or the look that's something else we're going to talk about too but uh, Adam what do you reckon I mean, obviously, AI, it's got to be artificial intelligence, um, which I think is one of the, probably the big things about this particular new drone. It's the fact that it looks like they're going heavy on the automation front, or at least allowing you as the user to program in your own uh, your own automation. So I think ah. that's probably mm. more, more why it's, it's AI, it's artificial intelligence. Oh, I see. So focusing maybe slightly less on the user, more of the, the feature sets of the drone and letting it do more of the work, I suppose, really, which, again, is always useful, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, Matthew, your first thoughts. We'll move on to the style, I think, uh, on uh, sort of in the next uh, couple of minutes. But what do you reckon about the uh, sort of the name side of things leading on to that? What do you think? Uh, yeah, I think it's an interesting one, Tom. I think probably they've stuck with the Anafi name because of the sort of consciousness or brand consciousness uh, of the market out there trying to sort of uh, maintain their market segment. As we said previously, they're not the best known manufacturer, but if they keep changing names with every model, then they'd never sort of gain any um, awareness around the, the sort of range of models within the Anafi name. So yeah, I think it makes sense. The predecessor to this is the Anafi USA, and this is a, a logical progression from that, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's definitely a, a recognisable name, isn't it? I think people straight away understand the brand, understand the model potentially as well. So yeah, I think they've done well on that side of things. So uh, yeah, moving on to the style, and I think that's the uh, the biggest one that kind of surprised me when I looked at it. I was to start with like, what the hell is that? And then suddenly it started to kind of grow on me, and I thought, actually, yeah, I I quite like it when companies kind of stray from the standard shape. You know, a bit like when DJI brought out the Mavic, that was quite a a, rever- uh, a revolution shape I suppose really that hadn't been done before and I think Parrot have jumped uh, ahead with uh, that styling again so what do we think do we like it yeah I think it's quite it's quite unique I like the fact that they've kind of they've kept the uh, the, the, the rear end as it were you know that is an affy mm. still you, know, you still recognize that as an affy mm, but you look at the front end and uh, if anyone that's that has seen it it's a bug, and obviously that you can you can see from their the promotions that they've taken <laughs> inspiration from it, it. from the bugs. Is it a, pra- a praying mantis? Is that what they was that? I what think it, it was something yeah. like that. Yeah, wasn't that's it? right. Yeah. They've used that in the marketing material. Yeah. That's right. It kind yeah, of faded so. into a drone, didn't it? Which was interesting, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. It, it looked good. Yes, yeah, so I think um, anesthet. Uh, sorry, not anesthetically. Aesthetically, <laughs> uh, I think it is very pleasing for sure. I think it's got a nice clean look to it, and obviously uh, that's easy to maintain and so on. But I think in terms of engineering, it looks to me as though they've gone away from having multiple hinging points for the arms to a single hinging point left and a single hinging point right. So mm. I think both arms swing around the same hinging point. So probably saved a little bit of weight in having constructed it that way. Yeah. Um, in terms of the physical look of the drone, while it is unique, it did make me think a little bit of the DJI FPV and the sort of stance of the body and that it's a little bit oh, higher yeah. rather than wider. Um, so yeah, interesting look to it. And certainly, as you said, Tom, something new and exciting mm. compared to the standard look. Layout, yeah, yeah i think i think that's certainly uh in their favor i think isn't it the styling it'll suddenly make people kind of you know uh sort of stand up and uh sort of be be quite surprised i think about the look and interested in it as well mm. 
Yeah. yeah, that's right. I think also the other thing, um, going back to our previous dis- discussion about this aircraft, is that the look made me wonder whether all of the information was a little bit misleading and whether it was aimed more at the commercial market, mm. excuse me, at the uh, recreational market for people to sort of buy something that looks really yeah. nice and is attractive. But now that we've got some specifications, that's certainly not the case, as of course we'll discuss yeah. in more detail soon. Yeah, for sure. No, I think you're right on that. Yeah. So uh, I think the biggest thing that they kind of mentioned to start with was obviously uh, the difference in uh, the communication between the transmitter uh, and the aircraft. Obviously, we're normally used to uh, either a Wi-Fi connection or 2.4, 5.8 gigahertz connection, which is almost the industry standard now. And um, they have decided to go with uh, the, a 4G connection, so a, a wireless uh, cellular connection, which I guess is all around us all the time, which is an interesting uh, sort of spec, I think, really. But as I understand, uh, Matthew, it's not only 4G. They might be using uh, both, potentially. Yeah, that's what I've seen as well. So I think it makes perfect sense that there is some redundancy in any system, particularly when we're talking about something uh, designed to to work in sort of automated flight patterns and so on. You need absolutely seamless communication. Mm. Um, so it seems as though uh, they will still be using some kind of enhanced Wi-Fi uh, for primary communication between the controller and the aircraft itself. But as the range becomes further, longer and longer, as you fly further and further away, when the system starts to see a sort of drop in the performance of the Wi-Fi, it'll then start integrating 4G and ultimately switch over to 4G uh, when the range gets far enough uh, when the when the Wi-Fi is no longer functional. So it seems like some kind of hybrid system that sort of runs on both simultaneously, but obviously very, very quickly and seamlessly. Yeah, I see. Yeah. And I think along with that, uh, obviously another benefit of using the 4G connection is the ability for the aircraft to actually uh, continually upload its data as it's flying. So if you're taking lots of different photographs or videos, etc., and you're wanting to process that in uh, a type of software, I think it's probably only Pix4D, I imagine, because that is their software. It will continually do that as it's flying. So there's no great big sort of getting home and having to upload a load of data because it's already done it, which is pretty cool as well. So that's uh, that's very interesting, I think, too. Yeah. And it, what do you think, yeah. Adam? on that side of things yeah i mean just in terms of the sort of the 4g transfer yeah it's um it it's transfers straight to pix 4d provided you have got obviously the, your 4g um connection mm. uh they did a promo image of um yeah of, of positano in italy it's somewhere i've actually i've actually been on holiday beautiful place ah. and um you can look at a video actually of it of a, a full 3d model it's absolutely incredible mm. uh, what they've managed to achieve um, and I, I'm, I'm assuming that it, this was all done with the 4G connection. I, I would like to assume for them to, to demo that. Um, I think that'd be really useful, you know, being able to upload your data without thinking, oh, God, I've got to make sure I keep hold of my memory card. Or, you know, yeah, if anything happens, yeah. it's like, well, actually, it doesn't matter too much. It's all in the cloud. That's fantastic. Mm. Yeah, that's a big bonus, isn't it, for any kind of mechanical issues as well, I suppose, too. You've got all your data saved as as you go, which is great, isn't it? Yeah, that's true. Interestingly, when I looked at the specifications, I also noticed um, that it does have space for an SD card as well, of course, as a cellular or a SIM card. Mm. Um, so I wonder whether it records the data on board as well or not, whether it sort of duplicates the data. Yeah. I would have thought it would have, would have thought it, um, it'll save it locally yeah. and then upload said files to the cloud rather than, because it, ha- it will have to save it somewhere for it to give it chance to upload so yeah it'll it'll save Fair it locally enough, yeah oh, i see ah, so that clarifies that then yeah yeah and i guess while we're sort of on this subject i think it's probably worth mentioning uh the fact that they were talking about uh, obviously the range of the aircraft and i guess in theory uh it's now unlimited i suppose you know the only limitation now on your connection quality is actually um how much battery you've got left to actually get the aircraft back again which is a great selling point you know quite a good thing to kind of you know uh sort of boast about i suppose really but again not overly useful in certainly this country i guess yeah i mean obviously in the uk and and europe um as well um obviously you've got to maintain visual line of sight unless you're um flying with beyond visual line of sight operational authorization which to be honest nobody really has it's still only in the trial phases and yeah we had a few of those um, obviously during the pandemic with the the nhs uh trialing to delivering um uh, supplies to uh, some of the islands and that was still only you know one or two flights throughout the whole year mm. um beyond that though you know it's, it is a great selling point to buy by all means you know, it's fa- absolutely fantastic technology but from 
your average, well, perhaps not your average Joe, but most companies won't perhaps won't realise that yes, you, you know, this has the capability of going out as far as you can get a 4G connection, which, you know, again, depends on where you are in the country. You know, some places you might not get 4G. Um, <laughs> but, you know, provided you have got a wide 4G coverage, practically, from regulation point of view, you can't do it no. unless you've got those permissions. But nobody really has. No, it's interesting. I think it's a good thing, kind of, again, like I say, to boast about or to future-proof the aircraft. I guess that's going to be quite relevant potentially in the future. But no, at the moment, I suppose, no, not overly relevant uh, for what we're doing. So uh, yeah. brilliant. I, so- mean, I, mean, I mean, from a safety point of view, I suppose if you take away the beyond visual line of sight or extended visual line of sight point of view, it's still great though that even if you keep it within visual line of sight and you, you know, as we've said, you know, your Wi-Fi drops out, mm. provided there is a 4G connection, you've still got connection. So it's yeah. actually quite nice because it adds an extra layer of redundancy to your aircraft, yeah, which true. Yeah. most other aircraft, you know, DJI aircraft, don't have. No. No, that's it. No, it's a definite bonus, I think, there too. So that's interesting. Um, okay, brilliant. So let's uh, move on. We've got quite a few little bits to talk about here, so we won't uh, spend too long on each one. Uh, but the next thing that I thought was quite interesting was uh, obviously the gimbal placement. I think that looked pretty cool and quite interesting. But also something that's very new uh, that I don't think has been done before at all is the uh, the collision avoidance sensors. Rather than kind of plastering them all around the aircraft, uh, not mentioning any names, uh, but they only seem to have uh, a couple. <laughs> Do you mean the name, Tom? Uh, The name, yeah, I should probably say that. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, they've actually got them mounted uh, kind of on the same gimbal and they can actually move uh, independently of the camera. Uh, That's very interesting. Matthew, what do you reckon? Yeah, I think that's um, a very, very interesting development. I'd like to understand it better and sort of have a play with one one day would be great to sort of really understand what the, what capability that gives. But it does make you think that the aircraft has to be safer. It's if in effect, it's able to sense all around it, forwards, backwards, up, down, etc. Mm. That has to be an improvement. Yeah. Uh, the other thing which I noted, uh, apart from the sensors, uh, is also that the gimbal can point vertically upwards and downwards, mm. which very few aircraft can actually do. I know the Anafi has more freedom of, of movement, but I think if I'm not mistaken, that's also a first in that it, the camera can physically point vertically upwards and vertically downwards. Yeah, and I think uh, probably from a processing point of view, rather than having eight sensors to kind of decode and understand, it's only got two steps stereo cameras and they can move so i imagine processing power is probably less for just two a bit like ourselves you know we don't have eyes all around our head we just move our head around and that seems to work well doesn't it for us so i think that's probably where they're trying to sort of uh, aim towards i suppose as well so yeah that'll be interesting to try that it perhaps depends on the lenses when you know if they are full fisheye lenses you know just Mm. having those two uh, you know if it has full almost full coverage because it is fisheye yeah, yeah. Um, that might be why it saves it. Mm. I, I say I haven't, I haven't found those specific details, but no. I, I, I'm potentially assuming, especially with that whole, you know, the the praying mantis Luke mm. here with the two two eyes on the I side. Was, you know, the, having that yeah, whole was, fish eye all around. <laughs> I was about to say exactly that. It's actually interesting that uh, on their promotional um, information, they literally use the words "inspired by nature," and there's <laughs> the picture of the praying mantis. So I think it's literally that. Perhaps one of the engineers sat there and saw how nature does it and thought, "Well, that's got to be the most efficient way." Yeah, potentially. Yeah, yeah I guess we'll uh, we'll wait and see on that one. Uh, we just need a, a few people to buy them and come and do a flight test, Matthew, and then we can see them, can't we? That's how <laughs> that's how we normally do it. <laughs> um, cool. Okay, so uh, we spoke about the camera very briefly obviously uh the main selling point i think for uh this particular camera is the 48 megapixel sensor which is pretty damn big really i think for uh uh, sort of any camera actually let alone one on a relatively tiny aircraft so um, uh, adam you're our resident sort of a camera guru so what do you think 48 megapixels will that be usable and good It'll certainly be sufficient for high quality uh, inspections. I mean, you've got the, um, I, again, I haven't, I haven't had a chance to sort of delve ha- into how big the actual uh, sensor itself uh, is. Yeah. Oh, no, actually, I've just found it there. So it's a half inch sensor. So okay. not bad. Not not bad. You know, it's not your one inch sensor, but half inch sensor. Um, certainly not bad at mm-hmm. all. Um, okay. It'd be interesting to see whether it is 48 megapixels um, sort of across the sensor or whether it's, um, you know, one of those where it captures, you know, four images and then stitches them together, uh, yeah. that kind of way of doing it. Um, I would assume it is a full 48 megapixel um, sensor rather than, you say, it's... Mm. It, um, uh, taking four and then stitching them together. I don't yeah. believe it does that. No. Um, but yeah, it should should make some absolutely incredible images. Yeah. Um, but really, if you are 
Although saying that, it depends on the price, I suppose, really, of this particular <laughs> aircraft. You know what? If uh, if it is that you can get another aircraft that's a thousand, two thousand pounds, but this one's four thousand, and it is for photography that you're after, it might not be the one for you. Um, but I'd say certainly if it is the inspection route you're going down, it's it's certainly one to consider. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And that's very similar, I guess, uh, to the other specs of the uh, the sort of the video and the camera, etc., uh, which is uh, the standard of HDR10 as well, which I think is uh, probably a step in the right direction, I think, for a lot of uh, post-processing or to make post-processing easier, I suppose, as well. Yeah, it's interesting that they're going down the uh, HDR, especially as it's kind of, I would say, marketed more as, um, you know, for doing photogrammetry and for doing potentially inspections. They've mm. They've... They've actually tagged on some nice features for those that want to do, um, you know, nice video capture. You know, having yeah. that option of doing HDR8, HDR10, uh, you know, 14 stops of dynamic range, 10 bit color depth. It's mm. yeah, they've really packed and packed in some good tech in there for those that do want to capture, um, you know, beautiful cinematography. Yeah. Yeah, no, it does look good. Yeah, and I guess we'll have to just wait for a few uh, bits of footage to come out before we can sort of analyse it, I suppose, really. But uh, no, it all looks like they're heading in the right direction with everything too. And I think they also touched upon uh, faster data capture as well. So again, not a huge amount of information on that, but I think uh, they were just sort of touting how well it can kind of process and how quickly it can capture the data as it's flying as well, which is interesting too. Um, they then moved on to talking about uh, specific uh, APIs, I think, for the aircraft as well. And they showed some quite interesting ones of uh, almost like a specific app that was controlling the aircraft. Uh, and it was actually uh, surveying a wind turbine in a specific route, which was quite interesting too. So I think, like we've mentioned, they are definitely aiming towards that kind of survey contractor sort of area i think with that side of things what do we reckon is that kind of what it's aimed i think that's what it's aimed at isn't it yeah it certainly must be i think all of these features that we've been talking about in terms of collision avoidance as well becomes very relevant in those sort of environments um and i think the flexibility of being able to create your own flight paths and so on uh, for that sort of application is something quite unique i must say the overall feel of the launch of this drone is that it Although on face value doesn't seem that revolutionary, I think every single factor seems to be a step ahead of the competitors in the similar sort of price range and so on. Although having said that, we'll talk about price just now and we don't have all the information available yet. But I think in terms of the size of the drone and the capability of the drone, as Adam said, they're packing in so many features into such a small lightweight aircraft. I think it really is a sort of glimpse of the future of where, where technology is headed for the, for the industry. Yeah. Yeah, and definitely for that side of things, I think repeatability is is key. And I think that's obviously what they're aiming for, to have uh, automated flights around wind turbines. Uh, again, I've done a lot of this type of flying, actually. And if you're flying manually around a wind turbine, it can take a long time. And the next time you do it, it's going to be slightly different. So if you can kind of uh, automate it and make it repeatable, you can almost get a whole wind turbine captured in about 20 minutes, actually, with some different aircraft that we won't go into now. But uh, that looks as though that's the type of thing they're aiming for. And if you can repeat the process for, you know, 50, 60, 100 wind turbines and put the data together, it'll, you know, obviously look much better than just the odd uh, photograph in from different angles, etc. as well. So I think that's probably what they're aiming for uh, there as Definitely. well. Definitely. I mean, it's yeah, certainly absolutely. the um, this open source um, features that go got going on here. The, the software de development kit, mm. um, the open source software is absolutely fantastic. Because, like as you're saying, you know, if, if it is a company can invest in a fleet of these aircraft, develop a piece of software that's tailored to them, mm. and you know, just upload it to all their devices without thinking, oh god, I've got to pay. Well, I've got to you know outsource all my data is going to be outsourced to another company. You know what? Yeah. If it's, it can all be kept in house and secure. It, it's absolutely fantastic you know this is the whole thing and this is i think this is one of the big things with parrot now the where they are um trying to set themselves up as as a security-led company and i yeah. suppose it's quite prevalent now in a lot of companies you know apple's going quite heavy on this with the privacy mm -hmm. um you know, trying to separate themselves away from uh, other companies and i think parrot's trying to do a very similar thing where they're trying to take it away and saying actually your data is not going to go to another foreign country um you know to a, a country where you know you don't know what who, what they're doing with your data, so it's going to be great for you know, for for governments and security services to be able to actually say, well, here's here's a piece of software we've developed. It's not going to anyone else, but we can we can upload it to all our aircraft. Yeah, 
Yeah, and that leads us quite nicely to the next bit actually about the uh, security and the GDPR. They they actually mentioned that it was DJ, uh, sorry, uh, GDPR compliant, uh, which is obviously a, a massive bonus. And also they've got dedicated chipsets that kind of look after the data and obviously keep it very secure as well, which is great. So yeah, they're definitely focused on that, I think, which is uh, an interesting uh, not idea, I suppose, but an interesting avenue to explore. I guess there must be a, a sort of a, a, an area in the market that hasn't been catered for yet, I suppose. Well, that's, uh, I mean, you've got, um, I mean, some obviously potentially military bases, um, a lot of government contracts now are actually specifically saying in their contracts that they don't want DJI drones, mm. and they, they're naming them quite specifically, or either on the bases or um, in a particular piece of airspace or capturing specific types of data. So, yeah. um, you know, they're making sure that they are covered for the inevitable. You know, there's, I saw a feature, uh, I read a feature that you know, there's literally going to be a one button on the on the aircraft. I don't know if it's on the aircraft or on the in the software, the controller. Mm. Regardless, you press that button and it wipes all the data from it securely. Oh, right. um, you know, without it, you know, if if it is, I suppose that you know, you potentially hired one of these in. Mm. You could say like use it and then you know wipe it before you send it back yeah. and you know that your data it actually can't be used by somebody else yeah yeah that's good isn't it again that's exactly what i think a lot of people want from a from an aircraft especially one that's taking you know hundreds of thousands of photographs of anything actually as well so i think it's interesting that they're yeah framing or uh sort of focusing on that side of things too um a couple of other bits and pieces that they actually mentioned towards the end of the uh, the presentation as well. So quite uh, actually, it was bigger than I thought. Actually, looking at the picture, I thought it was actually the size of the sort of the standard and affi, but I think it's bigger. Uh, about nine hundred grams is uh, is what they say, uh, and they also say that it is uh, weather resistant as well. So what that actually means is uh, something uh, something that we'll find out later, I guess. But uh, yeah, lastly, uh, Matthew, what do you reckon about those sort of last couple of specs? Is that kind of correct do you reckon are they aiming for the right uh, audience yes i think certainly they've got a very clear um market that they've laid out that they're looking to sell this specific aircraft to but something that we chatted about internally that i think is just a bit of sort of uh, first of all a bit of banter but also a bit of speculation is the styling inside of the aircraft makes me wonder whether there will be another version of this aircraft launched using the same sort of physical hardware and structure and so on but more aimed at the sort of hobbyist etc mm. so not so focused on all of these uh, technological advances so perhaps they'll bring out a different version and going back to our previous conversation and our little bit of banter about the certification perhaps <laughs> then we'll see a certified version of it coming about yeah that's right because it it's not certified is it i don't think so uh, i think if i remember rightly that was me and adam who said it wasn't going to be and uh, yeah we were right so sorry matthew <laughs> yeah that's true so i also uh, one of the reasons why i took a flyer and said perhaps it would be certified is apart from in terms of sort of specification and so on one of the requirements of course moving forward is that for the aircraft to be sold in the eu market and in the uk market they will need to be certified as well mm. so my thoughts sort of leading on from that is the fact that it isn't certified again sort of reinforces the thought pattern that there is going to be further development in the foreseeable future because if they thought they'd be selling this aircraft for the next five years then they would have certified it surely mm. because they wouldn't be able to continue selling it after or once the requirement is in place so certainly i think there's more to come moving forwards as well yeah, yeah. so whether that's an update on that model or you know like you mentioned maybe a smaller cheaper version that will be certified something like that i guess we'll we'll see i suppose adam is there anything well the other thing add? you've got to you've got to think about it is um obviously you know as with all these manufacturers they're not just aiming at the the european market you know this was aimed at a global market you know in the us you know there's it's whereas you know the certifications the classifications don't apply there so it, we could be mm. you know we still could be wrong potentially that it might come out and it might just slip under the radar you know maybe for yeah. for us in the uk and you know and you know, as consumers in the uk and in, in europe we're all going yeah we want these certified drones but actually, from a manufacturing point of view, it might not be a big deal for them. They're just like, well, it's no. They release it, then it's just that it's a C one drone, it's a C two drone, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter to us. Um, you know, we've built it for for this purpose. We're not bothered about it having a low speed mode. It being no. built to this certain degree. It's like this is what we've built. It ends up being, it, you know, it could still be a C three aircraft. You know, it could be a it could be a C three aircraft, and we're like, oh, yeah. people about, like, oh, well, you know, it's nine hundred grams. It should be a. C one or C two? Well, no, it no. 
to see three drone, but you can still fly it with an operational authorization yeah. you know, in the specific category. It doesn't yeah, matter. Obviously. And I guess I guess we're so focused on that element of it that we think it's going to be big news. But I guess manufacturers probably they don't think it's that big. It's not going to suddenly be the headline, is it, of their keynote? Oh, it's certified because you know they're not bothered. It might just you know be certified uh, accidentally to a certain extent, I guess. And obviously for for certain uh, sort of. Uh, countries obviously that would be great news but it's not the headline uh that the manufacturers want to tout i suppose is it really necessarily no, and again you know if they put that into the big um the big announcement um global and their global mm. announcements the u.s are just look at you know which, yeah look, uh, viewers in the u.s are just look oh, what does that mean <laughs> what's that mean? what do you mean quite certified drones they, yeah. they don't care no exactly. uh, it's like i say it's only for the uk and the european so it might be that you know what it, it just is you know if you did buy one it might just you know you open the box and it's got a c1 mm. stamp on it or c2 yeah, stamp you know, whatever it is mm. so matthew might be right he still could be <laughs> still could be there's still yeah. a chance <laughs> i'll concede on this one for now until we see the stamp it's not certified no, from our perspective that's it yeah fair enough so uh yeah i think that's uh pretty much all the uh stats and uh statistics talked about there so on the whole i think uh, an interesting looking aircraft more interesting than i thought it was going to be actually so that's uh, definitely a, a positive um and uh yeah i think that's uh quite a nice place to sort of come to uh sort of a, a conclusion i suppose really so uh, anything else anything uh, anything anyone wants to add at all uh, what do you reckon yeah, Tom, I think just one thing we haven't mentioned is where people can go and have a look at this information themselves so they can ah, head yeah. over to parrot.com. Uh, all of the information is available there and there's some promotional videos and so on. So, yeah, good to um, be exposed to the latest technology. Well worth having a look. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Brilliant. Yeah. Anything from you, Adam? Have you covered everything you wanted? Yeah, that's pretty much everything. Um, and just a quick one that I've just picked up. Obviously, we take weather re- weather resistance or rain resistance. Mm. It's uh, it's IPX three. Uh, so the oh. X means that uh, actually it's not been uh, classified that it's it can withstand dust. I don't know. Oh, uh, the okay. X just ha- means that you know <laughs> it, we don't know whether it is completely no. sealed up. But the three means that it is. It's got some water resistance from uh, from certain angles. Very much you know oh, the okay. IP forty three that we talk about ah, on the, on the um, on the course on the A two C F C course. Yeah. Um, whereas the this is like say IP X three. The X being um, nothing. Um, <laughs> the three I being um, yeah. water falling as a spray at an angle at up to sixty degrees from a vertical. Oh, from okay. the vertical so um you know it, it's perhaps it might have been oversold as as weather resistant it's got some weather yeah. resistance or it's, but it's i'd say it's not a it's not waterproof it's not a, or anything it's like not that, waterproof. It? no that's it yeah so i yeah, guess it's, of course of course that's barely relevant anyway because you can't collect much data in the rain no uh, in the best of times no people forget about that <laughs> don't they as soon as you get a drop of water yeah. on the lens it's game over isn't it anyway so yeah, that, yeah that's it so brilliant cool okay well anyway i hope you all uh, enjoyed that little uh, chat about the uh, the parrot and affi ai and uh, yeah we'll see you uh, again soon for uh, our next proper episode i suppose really so uh, obviously this is uh, uh, on top of our weekly episodes as well so um yeah we'll uh, look forward to talking to you all soon and uh, yeah the only last thing i need to say is uh, uh, fly safe and blue skies everyone see you later <laughs>